Okay, uh, thank you, Alfred. Um, I was just about to say that, um, yeah, all the bugs are due to me and uh, scream at my icon on GitHub if you found some. <laughs> all right, um, today's topic uh, is um, extending JSX graph with WebAssembly. And uh, yeah, it, it went for the introduction, uh, thanks to Alfred. I have one slide here. Uh, my name might be familiar to some, but they might not be able to put the finger on it exactly. Uh, and it's, you can find it in the readme file in every um, JSX graph source code file. And so if you find on GitHub this small grumpy uh, um, icon, you can see at the top with the um, orange arrow pointing to it. Uh, if there's a bug, it's because of me. Um, so unfortunately, I had to leave the JSX graph team in 2014, early 2014. Um, because my um, yeah position at the University of Bayreuth was um, yeah up, yeah. so uh, then I joined Method Park, and Method Park is a small company in Erlangen. And what we do is we um, provide engineering services for customers, mainly in the medical field. And um, so I do a lot of work for customers, and I never get to see how the people are actually using what I'm building. And it was kind of similar in the beginning for Chase XGraph and with Chase XGraph, where we had that board where the people like Murray <laughs> came um, along and um, asked questions and came with their problems. So um, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because um, I'm not used to getting positive feedback for what I'm doing. I'm not seeing the people using the things I'm building. So that's why the last two days, and I hope today will be the same, were um, incredibly amazing for me because I see all your people building awesome things with uh, Chase XGraph, and it was really a wonderful experience. So I just wanted to thank you all for this. And uh, really, yeah, it was very nice of you to share with us um, what you were building with Chase XGraph. So um, yeah, with that said, um, let's take a look at Chase uh, WebAssembly first, maybe. And when I take a look at something that's new to me, um, but one of the first questions that comes up is, um, am I actually able to use it and to deploy it? And are people able to use what I'm building? And if we take a look at this wonderful web page, caniuse.com, and search for WebAssembly, we can see that, yeah, it's pretty much supported everywhere. This is the current version and everything that is green says, yep, it's supported. And of the important browsers, only the Internet Explorer, um, I think Chess Ifra still supports Internet Explorer, even if it's deprecated for quite some time now. Um, it's the only one of the browsers Chess Ifra supports that doesn't support WebAssembly. And if we take a look at the usage relative, we can actually see that um, the browsers actually in use, they all support WebAssembly. One caveat though, um, please be aware, um, the version they are supporting for almost three years now is the MVP, the minimum viable product that was shipped with all browsers at the time. And since then, um, a lot has been developed with WebAssembly. Um, for example, um, multi-threading or big end, um, SIMD, and things like that, and they might not be supported everywhere. Also, if we look closely at this uh, roadmap table, we can see that um, WebAssembly is supported by browsers. Of course, it's WebAssembly after all. It's supported by Node.js, at least partially, um, but there's also these weird things like Vasm time and Vasmer. That is because these are not um, browser runtimes for WebAssembly, these are actually command line tools. So it is possible to have um, WebAssembly built as just a tool you run on your computer, not necessarily in a web browser. Just a minor tidbit to consider here. All right, and so what is WebAssembly actually? So this little definition, this small explanation I just stole from the WebAssembly webpage. And it says WebAssembly, or short WASM, is a general purpose virtual ISA. ISA is for instruction set architecture. 
um, designed to be a compilation target for a wide variety of programming languages. Much of its distinct personality derives from its security, code compression, and decoding optimization features. So it's quite a mouthful, um, but let's focus on these first on this first sentence, especially the orange highlighted um, parts. It's a general purpose virtual ISA designed to be a compilation target. So what does that mean? What is a virtual ISA, a instruction set architecture for those who don't know, um, is for example, x64, your personal computer, um, the instruction set is its instruction set architecture or the Java virtual machine, the def um, instruction set definition for its virtual machine is also an ISA or ARM, the CPU Raspberry Pi uses. Um, so an ISA is basically the interface between software and hardware, and it defines um, what the software can do with the hardware it runs on. So, and it is supposed to be a compilation target for a variety of um, programming languages. Um, for example, C and C++, C Sharp. Some of you may know Rust and Go, but um, it's not bad if you don't know them, they are quite new and very well worth a look if you're into new programming languages, especially Rust and Python you may know. And it's just a small collection of, um, or a small subset of languages where are actually have WebSMB support. Um, this web page here, um, awesome WebAssembly languages list on GitHub. It lists um, quite a few languages, all with a small icon that describes the status it is currently in. For example, it's the working progress do not use in production, it might be unstable or it's stable for production usage. And you can see we have things like COBOL in here or F sharp, uh, Forth, even JavaScript, uh, Kotlin, you might know. And for the Maxima, uh, folks in here and um, there's also scheme support I know it's not the same as common lisp I think Maxim is implementing common lisp but um, there might be chances that you might be able at some point to compile Maxima into a WebAssembly module and run it directly in the browser so how do you go about developing WebAssembly stuff how do you get your C++ code into the browser and run there it's basically like uh, you do with a usual compiler, right? You have some source code in C++, you use your C++ compiler for WebAssembly, there's um, LLVM, the Clan compiler, for example, that is WebAssembly support. And scripting has also, is a special WebAssembly compiler that is built just for that purpose. And um, you use that compiler and build a WebAssembly module. That's just a small binary file that you then can deploy uh, copy over to your web server and from there your HD, HTML page can download that module, uh, um, use some JavaScript API to pass it to the Masm compiler, which translates it to machine code and when it just runs in your browser. We'll see a few examples of uh, what that code looks like and how you can run it in your browser soon. First, uh, I'll get the theory out of the way. So, but that definition had some more words in it. And um, one of a few of the important ones are at the bottom. Um, much of its distinct personality derives from its security, code compression, and decoding optimization features. And we'll take a look at these um, on the next few slides. Um, just one remark um, up here. If you say, okay, virtual ISA, you said, Java, the Java virtual machine is in virtual ISA. You have a compilation target. You can compile Java to JVM. This all looks oddly familiar, like Java, Silverlight, and Flash. And say, so, yeah, the basic idea is the same, but um, the main difference stems from these few um, keywords at the bottom with security, code compression, and decoding optimization. And um, I'll make a the comparison, especially with Java in the next few slides. So um, the main focus on WebAssembly was, um, or one of the main focuses on WebAssembly was making it an extension of the existing web platform and not a replacement. Um, so with Java in the early days, Java was existing, existed and Java applets existed, I think before JavaScript even was a thing. And JavaScript was meant to be a replacement of that. 
And WebSMB tries to fix that approach in that JavaScript, the JavaScript um, economy, or no, ecosystem, not economy, the ecosystem of JavaScript and the web ecosystem as a whole. And WebAssembly do not try to be um, a competition. We try to coexist and um, build on top of each other and uh, yeah, try to um, yeah, just coexist. Uh, and that's why WebAssembly is actually, um, the WebAssembly runtime is embedded into the JavaScript virtual machine in the browser. And with that, um, WebAssembly has access to all the awesome web APIs that JavaScript already brings along with it, like the file API, uh, web workers, the IndexedDB, some may know about it, the DOM, especially, uh, WebGL and Canvas, of course, um, SVG as well, that for me belongs to the DOM. So um, that's one important distinction between all the other um approaches that were there in the past like civil light flash and uh, java it was possible to interact with javascript and from javascript but it wasn't as easy as it is with with WebAssembly. <clears throat> also when it comes to um, the execution pipeline um web assembly the file format for this web assembly modules that you download in your browser and compile to runtime code um it was designed in a way that it can be downloaded, read, compiled, and instantiated in a single pass and in parallel. So while um, the um, browser still tries to download and read um, the last few bytes of the WebAssembly module, um, the first bytes are already uh, compiled and uh, translated into machine code. Um, when we compare that with how JavaScript is run, you can see how um, it improves on the performance side of things. Um, JavaScript, for example, um, you provide some JavaScript on your web server, it's downloaded, and uh, then uh, the browser instantiates a parser, the parser analyzes the code, reads the code, and generates an abstract syntax tree. But tree has to be built before anything can be run because things might cross-reference each other. Um, so uh, only after the abstract syntax tree is built, um, an interpreter can start um, executing your JavaScript code. And um, if the interpreter realizes, okay, this piece of code is run so often and also always with the same parameterization, then it will um, mark that code as hot and will instantiate a compiler that will compile this piece of code into machine code. And if that compiler realizes, okay, it's called really often, it will even um, optimize that machine code. So it can, re can run really fast. Um, so compared with WebAssembly, you download the WebAssembly module and compile it to machine code. You have the optimized version available immediately. Even your compiler can do some um, optimization beforehand on the WebAssembly code. And compare that with JavaScript, you can see how um, WebAssembly code can, but does not have to, be faster than JavaScript code. Um, why is the JavaScript virtual machine so complicated? Why do we have an interpreter and a compiler? Why can't we just compile it to machine code? That's because in part of the dynamicity of J uh, JavaScript, uh, let's, for example, take a look at this piece of code. It's really simple. We have an array, one, two, three, four, five at the bottom, and we pass that to a function called sum of array. What that function does is it um, goes through all the elements of the array and sums them up. Easy, right? So the interpreter will see, OK, this for loop, it's called really, really often, always with uh, numbers. And the numbers are always integers. Uh, please, compiler, um, do your job and compile that to machine code. And then the compiler will generate optimized machine code and it can run really fast. Until then, it's run in the interpreter, not as fast as machine code. So the problem why we are doing this is the array could not only contain numbers, integers, it could only contain a string. So if, for example, we have an array with a million numbers, 
then we interpret it with a compiler do machine code. We, we can execute it as machine code, and but they still need a piece of code in the machine code that checks if the new parameter um, is still a number, is still an integer and not a string. Because once it encounters a string, the compiler, uh, the compiled machine code will be thrown away and the interpreter takes over again. So there's a lot of waste. Um, the interpreter is not as fast as uh, the compiled machine code. You can see JavaScript has still a few issues, although it's very fast. Um, um, it, it became very fast in the recent years. So, but with that said, WebAssembly is still not without its own issues. Um, so you can't just take your JavaScript project and um, rewrite it in C++, compile it to WebAssembly and say, yeah, uh, now it's fast. Uh, that's not how it works, unfortunately. Um, so because you still will have transitions between JavaScript and WebAssembly. Um, every time your C++ code does things in the DOM, accesses um, web APIs like web workers or WebGL, you have that transition between um, that red border that is um, drawn in here. Um, what does that transition entail? Usually you will have to convert data between the two runtimes because how JavaScript represents data might not be the same as how WebAssembly, your language in WebAssembly represents the data. Also, um, WebAssembly does not have access to the JavaScript memory. It has its own um, small area of memory within the JavaScript virtual machine, but um, it can't access anything outside of that uh, memory. Um, but you can access the WebAssembly memory from the JavaScript side. It is represented as a buffer that you can access with typed um, arrays, where you can um, copy in, for example, um, an image that the WebAssembly module should do calculations on. And uh, that work has to be done. You have to copy over um, the input and copy over later after the WebAssembly module was run, um, the output again from the WebAssembly memory to your JavaScript representation. There's also a call overhead. So the transition internally inside the browser between the two runtimes can also cause some cost. Um, that was especially in Firefox um, and I think also Chrome, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, very well optimized. So it's really minimal, but it's still there, albeit very small. Um, but these problems you can mitigate uh, by maximizing the work done in the MASM module and minimizing the number of transitions between the two. All right, um, let's see some examples. Um, I prepared a few examples um, in the realm of JavaScript and uh, JSX graph, of course. And uh, the first example I would like to show you is, I'll make it a little bit bigger, is this. It's really unexciting. It's just a board with a point. Um, but if we look at the source code, we don't see the construction. We see the usual chase. Uh, let me make it a little bit larger so we can read it. Um, we can see the CSS and JavaScript from JSX graph. Um, and we see this CPP JS that has some non JSX graph code in it. It's unimportant um, because um, this CPP JS was generated by the MScript and compiler based on some C++ source code. And this is the C++ source code. Um, we have some includes. Um, this is standard C++ includes, IOStream, CMath, and MAP. And we have some MScript and specific includes um, that are here to take care of the um, that red border I just showed you, right? The, that transition between JavaScript and WebAssembly um, MScript takes care of that and converts all the JavaScript values to C++ values and vice versa. So if we take a look at the main function here, we can see some struct um, board options um, that is very similar to, let's see what it looks like. It looks like this. We have a bounding box, we have a grid and we have an axis. And um, we fill that out we from minus two to six, six and minus two, we don't want to have a 
grid, but we want to see the axis. Uh, we say JXG board init board with into the box with these options and create a point. That looks very easy, but uh, in the background, <laughs> a lot of work has to be done to access the um, JXX graph code. And that is hidden away in this, um, yeah, um, wrapper layer, JXG CPP. Um, so this is where this val comes into play. Val is a mscripten structure that can um, wrap JavaScript um, variables. In this case, we check G namespace and we chase xgraph object in that namespace. And with some helper methods like call, uh, we can call methods on that JXGraph um, object, pass in some parameters, and uh, use the result to create a board. Um, similar, this example down here with a create point, um, we again use the uh, my board is a val. Again, this um, generic uh, mscript value that represents an arbitrary JavaScript value. We call the create element method on it, uh, pass in some parameters that also have to be wrapped in, uh, in, in the, as a val value. And yeah, that's how we can pass in arrays in here. We can create objects, JavaScript objects with that. And that's how we can interact with our Trace um, API from within C++. Um, you might also have noticed that down here we have a small function that is called fun. Um, it's just a small calculation. It gets in a T and returns a um, double value that is four times the sinus of one by T. And um, we export these two functions. And this is actually what we do in the next example. It's the libHTML example. Um, where we import again the cppjs module, we create our JSX graph box and um, use the module that is generated by mscripten. Once it is initialized, again, a reminder, we have to download the version module first, uh, read it, compile it, and instantiate it. That is all done asynchronously in the background. So we need that um, um, this callback function that is uh, executed once the WebAssembly module is ready. And once it is ready, we can um, create our board this time with JavaScript and create a function graph and use the fun function from within that C++ module. So we, what we do now is in here, we plot a function graph and use this function to plot it. Let's see how that looks. It looks like that. Let me um, reload it. And that's the example. So, um, it's pretty easy to access um, code you wrote in C++ from within JavaScript. Um, one remark though, I was really lazy here. Um, you shouldn't do it that way because if you do it this way, um, this function will be called like a thousand, four thousand times. I can't quite remember how often it will be called. Depends on the size of your board. And that's exactly how I should not do it. Um, the way to go about this is um, to call it once with the few thousand values you want to evaluate, because um, that way you will transition that border once the JavaScript WebAssembly border and not 4,000 times, which comes with some kind of um, yeah, overhead here. But um, uh, it's still fast enough. And for the last example, I will show you the example first. Um, <clears throat> it's a circle that goes through the origin and point A. But the funny thing about this is it looks just like the circle element, but in fact, it is not the circle element. You can see a little visual bug. Uh, it's a function graph, it's a plot. It's an implicit plot of the circle equation. And uh, I can't remember if implicit plots are added to JavaScript JSX graph. Um, if not, you might be able to use a Python library called matplotlib um, to do implicit plots. So this is the source code of that example. And in here you can see there's some script Python. Um, that type script Python only tells the browser or causes the browser to ignore it because the browser can't interpret script Python types. Um, that's just for me to um, define the script. You can also just very well um, use a JavaScript string for it. 
Um, I like it this way because it's a bit cleaner. Uh, so this is one script that initializes the Python script. It imports some libraries like NumPy and Matplotlib and the JS library. And it defines a grid where we want to plot our circle equation. And down here we have another script which will be um, run on every board update. So every time we um, drag the point across the board, uh, this piece of Python code will be executed and the results will be uh, sent back to JavaScript. So um, here we read the coordinates from the um, point we just saw, point A, and um, calculate the sum of the squares of its coordinates and pass that into this function, which is the circle function with radius, which is the distance of that point to the origin. We plot it and we run some Python code that I won't go into details here to extract the plot data. And down here is the corresponding JSX graph, the um, construction. We um, first read the Python code in here, store it in a string and um, initialize the board with the curve, the point and the curve. We store the point in a global variable so we can access it from the Python code. And um, this is not M script, so we have a different um, callback here. So this is actually called Pyodide. You can see it here. That's a package we are using. And um, we load some packages. And once they are run, we run the init code. And then we define the update data array code for the update data array function for the graph. And in here, we run the plot code, the Python plot code, extract the data that is returned. and pass it into the graph. And then we update the board for the first time. And as you can see, it's pretty fast on the update. But um, to be honest, it's very slow on the initial um, rendering. So you can see the spinner maybe at the top here. Now with this page is loaded and it, it takes some time for the initial circle to appear here. Um, the reason for that is that this Pyodide library is like around 40 megabytes in size, which all have to be downloaded and uh, compiled and initialized. So yeah, it's not really prime time ready, possibly not even um, for uh, mobile devices. Actually, all these examples don't work on mobile devices. I only an hour before the talk realized um, my my maybe have a time to look into it and update, um, update the examples. Um, but yeah, it's still a very big package. If you're interested in it, you might be able to pull out the relevant parts. And um, if you do, please let me know, I'd be interested in it. So we work just a few examples for um, how you can call JSXGraph API functions from within other languages in WebAssembly modules, how you can access code in WebAssembly modules from within JSX graph and um, how you can yeah, use Python implicit plotting library to um, do some implicit plotting in J with JSX graph. So what are the benefits? Um, you can reuse algorithms from existing libraries like we just saw with matplotlib. Um, you might get increased performance of the algorithms. There are a few factors involved that have a say in this, but um, yeah, try it out and see if it improves the performance. If it does, great. If it doesn't, um, yeah. And uh, it can decrease resource consumption. Um, the WebAssembly modules are optimized for size via a binary file format that um, can yeah, transmit information in a more compressed way. Um, it will, yeah, decrease the CPU and RAM resource consumption because you don't have to keep all the abstract syntax free in, in the RAM and you don't have to have interpreters and compilers running around in the background. Um, but WebAssembly is not a performance guarantee. Still, if you want to use it, try it out, but measure your results first. Yeah? Measure it before, measure it after you tried to um, uh, to, you deployed your performance improvements and if it works, great. If not, well, you better keep looking. And yeah, 
that's it pretty much from my side.